Hi everyone, and welcome to the Objective Performance Podcast, the podcast to keep improving and reach the top. I'm Julian Astorik, French physiotherapist and SNT coach. Every two weeks, I'm going to interview sports physiotherapists, physical trainers, SNT coaches, or others who follow and take their athletes to the highest level. The first part of the interview will be about their journey. Where do they come from? Where did they study, travel, and start their career? Then, what they are currently doing and what we can learn from it. What is their current research topic? How can this improve our skills? And finally, we will discuss their mentors, their favorite books, and how can we contact them. As usual, I'm counting on your support. So if you like the episode, don't forget to give this episode five stars on No Minute as well as on Spotify and Apple Podcast with good comment. In the same way, I encourage you to share this episode on social media, especially in story on Instagram or via a post on LinkedIn. It's clearly what helps me the most to make this podcast known. Have a good listen, everyone. Hi, Inda. Hello, Jay. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. What about you? I'm very well. I'm very well. I, I'm, I'm back in, in sunny Doha here, so uh, look, enjoying the, the summer heat for a couple of more weeks. Yeah, great, great. I think it's it has to be warm in Doha right now, more than in Switzerland a little bit. But yeah, yeah. But as an Irishman, I, I enjoy the heat, so uh, <laughs> you will hear no complaints from me. That's for sure. <laughs> great, great. And uh, uh, can you give us your um, definition about the performance? And first of all, I, I would like to thank you very much to uh, accept my invitation for this podcast because it's been a while. I wanted you to get it on. And now it's time. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. No, my, my absolute pleasure. My absolute pleasure. And, and a, a nice good question to start as well. Mm. Um, I suppose performance means different things in different disciplines. We, we naturally look at it from a sporting point of view, but actually mm. maybe we're better off looking at it from our own professional point of view. Uh, mm. Performance is getting the job done. Um, and so when you're talking about high performance, you're talking about people that can get the job done um, in a highly efficient way, in a highly thorough way, even in difficult circumstances. And so if you take that in a, in a rehabilitation case, the ability to get the job done is obviously an accurate diagnosis. It's uh, obviously identifying all of the contributing factors to that initial injury, but also residual maybe um functional deficits as a result uh, and being able to put together a, a program or an intervention that will take your patient or your athlete back to where they were or if not better than they were before and mm -hmm. so when you're looking to improve your performance I think a lot of it is built on self reflect a lot of it's experience you know you 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 learn from your mistakes mm -hmm. so but you also need a very reflective uh, disposition to, to constantly say what went well, what didn't go well. Uh, the reality is most patients and athletes get better in spite of us rather than because of us. Um, but if you're constantly looking for where your weakest links are and you're constantly putting interventions in place or learnings in place to improve those gaps, then ultimately you, your consistency of performance and your level of performance should, should improve on an ongoing basis. And that what's, that's what makes enjoyable work. <clears throat> Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, can you explain us a little bit of your background? I know you're from uh, Kevin, right? Yes, which very is, well, uh, <laughs> Which is, someone told me it's one of the uh, greatest uh, GAA country in uh, Ireland. <laughs> so can you... A little bit of wine on board when they told you that, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. And can you explain us where you grew up a little bit and uh, what kind of uh, kid were you? Did you already like sport a little bit? Of uh, Yeah, explain us. Yeah, um, so uh, I am from, from Cavan. It's, it's a, a county or a region on the border with Northern Ireland. Um, it is a relatively rural place um, and Gaelic football, which would be indigenous to Ireland, Uh, is probably along with a little bit of golf and maybe handball that's that's primarily what you do in Cavan there are those okay. that, that play soccer and rugby that, that might argue differently but certainly in all the schools or the majority of schools uh, both primary and secondary Gaelic football is it 
Um, and so I'm the eldest of five kids in my family. Um, my dad would have played sport. My mother was from Galway, which is over a beautiful area over the west of Ireland. And um, school was, I, I enjoyed school. Um, I was lucky that I was in a class with a group of people who were, um, they were relatively high achievers in sport and academia. So there, there was, a, I wouldn't call it competition, but there, there was a good momentum to it. And um, I was very, very lucky that I played on a, a good team where in my local town um, and up until adult level and we had lots of success and I was fortunate to be surrounded by that. And I think sport is always very good for your, it's good for your confidence. It's good for your discipline. Uh, it's good for your mental health and your body composition. And professionally, it, it opened a lot of doors for me afterwards. And um, mm. a lot of my interest in, in growing, for example, comes from my, from my own surgeries and issues and, and whatever else. But also you build a big network uh, from, from playing at a certain level. And I was lucky enough to play with Calvin for a period as well. So, um, yeah, enjoyed sport. Sport and, and, and football was kind of centered to everything. Um, and and a little bit of academia around that, so yeah, great, perfect. And then, where did you uh, study? And uh, after study, where did you start working? Yeah, I did my undergraduate in uh, Trinity College in Dublin. Um, I was very fortunate actually on a couple of things. Number one is I always wanted to do physio, but it wasn't my number one choice. Okay. I thought I might like to do business or something else instead. Well, the way it worked out, I, I didn't get the course I was looking for and ended up doing computers for a year, which was great because um, I enjoyed the course, but it showed me what I didn't want to do. Um, and I had got my first year out of college out of my system. So when I was ready to go to, to physio in, in second year, um, I was able to transfer internally. And we had a fantastic program there, really good class, uh, some excellent lectures such as Fiona Wilson, who's published extensively as well. And I was very fortunate with the head start that it gave me in my career. Great, great. And after Trinity College, where did you start working? Uh, already in a sport surgery uh, clinic in Dublin or somewhere else? No, um, generally speaking, at that time, I sound like I'm very old, but generally speaking, at that time, uh, you would do your hospital rotations first. And I always mm -hmm. thought, and still think it's, it's very worthwhile, to be honest with you, you get a very good medical overview and it gives you time Like, as they say, when you qualify, you know enough not to hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need that time to, from an orthopedics or an outpatient point of view, sports. You, know, you need to build up your experience in a, in a safe and incremental manner. So I did. I worked initially in a, in a hospital called Lockmanstown in the south of Dublin. And then I moved to a bigger hospital called Blanchardstown. And there were some fantastic physios there. I learned an awful lot there in a two-year period. And then was very fortunate that I happened to be around Dublin when the sports surgery clinic was just opening. Um, mm. I was the uh, second physio recruited into the department. And so naturally over a period of a decade or a decade and a half, saw a lot of change. Um, mm. But again, it just shows you how lucky you are that th these things open at certain times and points and you're there to hopefully make the most of them. Mm. Mm. Amazing, amazing. And what was your role at the SNC? Yeah, it, it obviously evolved a lot. I was a relatively, I still had probably had four or five years qualification under my belt when I started, but uh, it was a relatively um, junior physio to start with. I had a range of, of, of roles inpatient and mostly outpatient. Um, most of that, I would say 50% post-surgical, 50% everything else. Um, mm -hmm. And about two or three years into being there, I decided or I had decided long ago but I left then to do I took a secondment to do my master's in Curtin University in Perth in Australia I, am, I knew several people who had gone to study there I was always very impressed with their level of knowledge so I was very lucky to spend a couple of years there uh, we, we had great um, great lecturers like uh, Peter O'Sullivan and Steve Edmonds and others very very fortunate And then um, I came back to Dublin um, and evolved into a head of performance role. I was very fortunate. I had two fantastic colleagues in Andy Franklin Miller and Anna Falvey at the time were in the sports medicine department um, who were two, 
outstanding clinicians, but also had great vision about where sports medicine could go. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were involved in the development of a biomechanics lab um, and the evolution of our rehab facility. And really, we had a, a phenomenal 10-year period there in terms of uh, the caseload that we were seeing, the academic output that we had, um, and the development of the department. So it, it really was a, a, a phenomenal journey uh, over that period of time. And you arrived in Aspital two years and a half ago as head of elite performance and development. Can you explain us your role over there? Yeah, it's a nice broad title, so you, you can fit, fit lots of things under it. Um, I think primarily I'm responsible for supporting the outstanding team we have in developing and refining our clinical pathways. So how do we do ACL? How do we do hamstring? How do we do groin? Um, and we already, I mean, there's already very, very high level practitioners there, but when we look at what we do, can we ensure that that's, you know, you come to Aspidar, you expect a certain level of care. So are we consistent in our application across the board? Can we pull in everyone's different expertise? Uh, but also, are we evolving our practice in an ongoing basis that, you know, at the end of every year, our ACL program should be better, our groin program should be better, our ankle program, Achilles program should be better. And um, whether that's through our clinical evolution, whether that's through working with external experts or whether that's through ongoing research that evolves our, our thought process and our programs. Um, so that's number one and, and working and standing on the on the shoulders of, of those that are there already, like Rod Whiteley and Ruda Katsafaki and other colleagues as well, that um, trying to evolve what we do. The second part then is probably around staff, taking those concepts in terms of in staff education. And, and professional development are, are we giving each of the staff members what they need based on their current experience to evolve their, their practice moving forward and um, there are research components to that but also then obviously attracting uh, top level talent from physio to come and come and join us in Aspidar and hopefully you know buy into the vision and, and where we're looking to go as an organization and um, but also attract international athletes and um, who are already coming and um, but are coming for more specialist services and support those athletes both in person but also as part of the wider team in the level of care we're trying to develop perfect perfect and you have made your phd on 3d biomechanics and rehab after acl reconstruction can you explain us what you found please yeah so my my phd um like all phds it had grand aims at the beginning but uh, the first thing i was interested in was when you're rehabbing anyway anyone you're looking to define at the beginning of the journey you want to know what the end looks like mm. and so what i was keen to know is what are the main biomechanical deficits uh, in someone who's had an acl rehab compared to a healthy athlete across a variety of tests uh, and there are some variables like knee extension moment that are relatively consistent across some tests and there are other ones where the front will play in or, or transverse plane are more things. So can if we know that they are the problems at the end, then our rehab should be working earlier in rehab to not have those issues at the end. The second thing was to try and identify what were the differences between those that went on to re-rupture and those that didn't. Um, and uh, while we found loads of differences between healthy athletes and ACL patients, there weren't as many differences between those that went on to rupture and those that didn't. So those that re-ruptured, those that ruptured the knee that they had reconstructed, they generally had slightly less quad strength and were slightly slightly less plyometric, um, but mm -hmm. slightly being the operative word there, and certainly nothing you'd be building a prediction model off. Uh, they did have slightly greater asymmetries during unplanned change of direction compared to those that didn't. That was about a 90 degree cut. And um, when it came to those that ruptured their healthy limb or the previous uh, rupture, the contralateral limb, there was much more clear picture there. So those that ruptured their healthy limb had much greater deficits in plyometric ability during double and single leg drop jump. They had less springiness, less ankle stiffness, uh, changes in moments, less center of mass stiffness. So those that went on to rupture their healthy limb uh, were less springy or had less plyometric ability than those that didn't. Not in terms of asymmetry, but in terms of absolute values. And that probably evolved, in many ways it makes sense, like in, in one way, uh, the, the primary way of loading your ACL is anterior tibial translation. So mm. therefore, the less springy you are, the less control you have in the sagittal plane, the more anterior translation you will have. But the second thing is you rupture your ACL in the first 40, 50 milliseconds after ground contact. 
Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's not enough time to say, oh, I'm in the wrong position or to change position mm-hmm. or even have a reflex. So therefore, the springier I am, the more activation I will have in my nervous system, my neuromuscular system prior to ground contact. Uh, and this is probably part of the reason why every effective ACL prevention program has had plyometric exercises included in them, mm. uh, as opposed to general strength exercise, which obviously are important for function and performance, but don't maybe perhaps don't have the, the influence on the nervous system that's necessary to influence load transfer on those early, uh, early ground contact times. Whoa, it's huge. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I spent three days at SSC one year, two years ago. Um, and I, I find it very interesting in terms of uh, yeah, 3D biomechanics and uh, uh, change of direction and anticipated uh, change of direction. Um, can you explain us again what's the difference between a, a patient with ACL surgery and elderly athletes? Uh, you, you talk about plyometrics and after an ACL surgery, you get less plyometry in both limbs or only the surgical one compared to the LC athlete? So generally what you'll see, you'll definitely see asymmetry and you'll see greater asymmetry. So the operated leg, as you'd expect, because of the insult of the injury and the insult of the surgery afterwards, hmm. uh, always has greater asymmetry in the single leg drop jump or, or symmetry of ground reaction force in the double leg drop jump. And that's very often, along with knee extension moment in the hop for distance from my colleague uh, Rudolf Katsavaki's work, they're nearly always the last two qualities to recover, nearly always. Um, but what you often see then is because an athlete's had a surgery, they can't jump on either leg. Um, mm. And so they lose or they, they detrain to a lesser mm. extent, but still detrain on the healthy limb as well. And so this is where my, my thought process has evolved is that plyometric training is incredibly important to resolve the asymmetry. But plyometric training is also incredibly important to build back up the overall activity levels and reactivity in the neuromuscular system on both legs, which will naturally detrain any time you have a big injury um, such as ACL. Okay, and so when do you start working on plyometric? On the, the LC leg, do you start maybe, a, I don't know, maybe a two weeks after uh, surgery? Uh, when do you start? And when do you start working on the surgery leg? Do, do you have kind of uh, assessment to know now you're yeah. ready, not sweating, not pain, uh, quadriceps strong enough, uh, etc.? How do you do? So in Aspatar, we have a, a pro, an ACL protocol, but we have an ACL curriculum. And so we know what our end exercises are. There are bounds, there are tuck jumps, there are single leg drop jumps. But what often happens is when we think of plyometric exercise, we think of those kind of YouTube, Instagram, high level plyometrics. When in fact, and especially when you look at, at what we're looking for in ACL, we can work on our ankle stiffness and our ankle mechanics incredibly early in the rehabilitation process and we should work it incredibly early and um, so example i'm on crutches one week i'm walking two weeks the third week i can start my early toe tap drills mm. and then it's really the progression through it is based on knee response and technical competency so if you're not good at it we're not going to progress you for the sake of progressing you if you haven't got a good technical model heel off the ground short ground contact time good active and passive uh, dorsiflexion the plantar flexion and um, but if your knee's a bit stiff the next day, we're not going to progress you on as well. And so what we would find is, and again, you wouldn't introduce probably any earlier than four weeks, but very early in the rehab, we would begin to enter that curriculum. Uh, you go from toe taps, alternate, you throw a band over the squat rack. You can, so you're doing unweighted or reduced weighted uh, alternate leg and single leg pogos. You take the band away. We have a variety of surfaces, such as a sprung floor, an air floor, a grass floor, a track, a court so you can you know, start to progressively influence the surfaces available to you. And then once the knee is, and the, as you said, the quad strength has really come on, then you can start to go into the higher level plyometrics that will require involvement throughout the kinetic chain, in particular the knee extension moment. But very often what happens is we, will is we lose out or we miss that opportunity to be very proactive in that first 8, 10, 12, 14 weeks when we can really hammer that ankle stiffness in, ta- in anticipation for what's coming afterwards. Mm. Mm. Fully, fully agree. And uh, um, 
what cognitive load you have to manage when you can anticipate the change of direction versus when you can't anticipate it. You know, you get your ACL surgery, and what's the difference in your brain and, and, and your uh, biomechanics? Yeah, I think there's there's two sides to that. So when we compared the difference between limb, we saw the same in asymmetries, uh, whether you are planned or unplanned. The asymmetries were slightly bigger in unplanned. So if you were sway, example, you would sway more, but the asymmetry was evident throughout. That's number one. So if anthem cognitive load seems to exaggerate the deficits that are already there. Um, number two is that Cognitive load, it's a very, in testing, it's very artificial. So you can call a color or you can have a light or whatever else. And I can be very responsive to that or not. I can be terrible at it. But that doesn't say how I'm going to react to a tennis ball coming over the net or a football coming at my head or whatever else. So we, we introduce cognitive load to reduce the deliberateness or the consciousness of the activity. But I can't make any inferences as to, you know, my reactivity doing it. Like we would use reactive, we would use virtual reality and reactive walls very early in rehab. Um, but I can't say how, you know, if I'm good at that, it's going to mean I'm good at reacting to heading a football or reacting to things. So there's always, while we can create every task, uh, motor uh, cognitive load is a, is a variation to that exercise. So for example, if I'm doing landing, I can do landing eyes open. I can do landing eyes closed. I can do landing with a water bag. They're all different stimuli to influence my motor pattern. If I add cognitive load, that is another stimulus to influence that motor pattern. Um, and so rather than thinking of it of, of like we work on cognitive or we work on, on, on thing, um, where we try to use cognitive load is it's another progressive stimulation to make the task more challenging that we're looking to develop. Um, and generally speaking, going back to your question, when you introduce cognitive load of whatever modality that will be, um, you normally see an exaggeration of the deficits that are there already. So for example, if you've reduced knee extension moment, it'll be slightly greater. If you have knee valgus moment, it'll be slightly greater. And so that's the, the primary influence that we see. Great. Great. And when you work with LC athletes and you make this kind of assessment, can you find some of them with more risk of ACL injury or, or growing pain? You know, when, when you assess them, do you know this one uh, uh, has more risk in the next year? Because I, I know his uh, step is maybe wide or uh, without control or, or everything. Do, do you, can you see it like this? Or is yeah. there much risk so, of, yeah. I, I think for any injury, uh, you cannot predict it. That's number one. Mm -hmm. um, but there are clear patterns, uh, and our research provided, there is a, a change of direction pattern that's more common in those with groin pain, and there's a change of direction pattern that's more healthy, more common in those that are healthy or don't go on to have groin pain. And it's not that both patterns aren't in the healthy group and in the groin pain group, mm -hmm. but mechanics is only one part of it. Your anatomy is a second part of it. So if you have a large clam lesion, a small ACL, if you have a family history of ACL rupture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your room for error is going to be different for the same biomechanics. Similarly, if you play football once a week or you're mm -hmm. playing football twice a day, the low going through your hip groin and pelvis or your wrist ACL injury is going to be modulated accordingly. So I think definitely when you look at biomechanical testing, you can definitely see more efficient patterns. You can definitely see less efficient patterns. And none of them I can say who's going to have groin pain or not. Um, but I can say that if you put in the right intervention, you can improve their room for error. And that's ultimately what we're trying to. We can optimize the performance and improve their robustness. And then hopefully with an appropriate loading program, they, they, they get on very well. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Um, athletic groin pain, can you explain what it is? Yeah, I don't know if I can because it, it covers so lot. I think athletic groin pain as a concept is non-acute groin injuries. Uh, so those that um, develop chronically 
or insidiously over time or those that start acutely but then linger chronically uh, over time. Um, I would separate out acute injuries of the adductors, the rec fem, the iliosoas. I would, I would separate all them. The, the, the pathomechanics are relatively similar, but the healing process and the healing times and the intervention are slightly different in those acute ones versus athletic groin pain, which is like an umbrella term for injuries related to the pubic bone, into the uh, muscular tendinous structures in the region, which is primarily the rex abdominis, the adductor longus, iliosoas, and obviously pathology of the, of the hip joint as well. Um, and so the uh, goal in athletic groin pain is it's quite difficult sometimes to work, often to work out where the pain is coming from. Um, partly because it's difficult, our, our pain provocation tests are sensitive but not specific. Partly because it's difficult to discreetly palpate individual structures, uh, at least reliably. And partly because they often have pain in two or three different areas when they come to see you. So which is the main pain, which is the secondary pain, and which program do we do? None of that really matters. Uh, it only matters when you're deciding is, is this injury for rehab or is it for something else? Um, and if it's for rehab, then I don't really care what you call it. I need to work out why they're become overloaded in that area, uh, whether it's a deficit in the local tissue or more commonly, whether it's a, a function, a capacity, a biomechanical deficit, that's pre preferentially overloading that structure or structures. And you see time and again, where you get those with, with chronic symptoms, you give them rest, their pain settles, they go back training, their pain comes back again. Mm -hmm. So is that that I didn't give the area enough time to heal? Uh, is it that I didn't um, repair the area? Or is it that I didn't identify what the problem was? Or I did identify it and my rehab program didn't change it? Um, mm -hmm. and that's where our reassessment is incredibly important mm -hmm. so when you have a chronic groin pain you don't need to know exactly what kind of structure first heal you just need to assess it and how do you assess maybe mobility uh, strength what kind of what kind of strength do you assess like uh, adductors uh, abductors also quadriceps and hamstring uh, the hip maybe the knee maybe the ankle what kind of assessment do you do well if you were if you work backwards and say you you see patterns in in change direction or running or they describe those activities as the most aggravating well then you would video or you would assess those activities you will commonly see uh, patterns that preferentially load one side to the other mm. pelvic drop anterior tilt trunk mm. rotation but whatever whatever that is and that's fine but then you need to work out why are they choosing to do that strategy? Uh, is it a motor control issue with the foot and ankle? Uh, how many times do you see someone get a syndesmosis surgery or a foot fracture and then end up with groin pain the following season? Um, is it a motor control issue? Not only a strength issue around the hip, but a motor control issue around the hip, in particular the deep rotators, glute main and iliopsoas. Uh, is it a, a, a trunk strength issue? In particular unilateral strength and in particular external oblique so have you the assessment and the exercises interventions to target it specifically and avoid continually to overload the rex abdominis and um, and then have you the ability to produce force at speed in your jumps in your plyometrics and then back in your running and change direction again so if, if you pick your end point which is i have pain when i change direction or i pain when i sprint mm -hmm. if you identify what is relevant to that pattern and then you break it down to all the potential contributors to that. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most comprehensive way to get from A to B, while concurrently ensuring that your pain provocation tests are improving every 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, great. And how do you manage the return to play? Do you accept some kind of pain? Or, or, or do you want no pain at all uh, when you are doing some cut? Or do you manage like... Uh, uh, you know, you accept maybe four on ten. Uh, depends about the the kind of pain they get. But yeah, how do you manage it? Do you accept pain or not? Depends of uh, um, AGP uh, types. So um, there's two parts of that. I think the first part is: Are you looking to manage the issue or resolve the issue? So I was I was with a Champions League club last week. And it's early in the season. 
So you want to resolve that issue. If you've groin mm. pain in September, you're not going to see May. Um, mm. So it's the time. If you have a Champions League final next week, you're going to manage the situation yeah, uh, and, and then worry about it and clean it up afterwards. So let's, let's assume we're going to resolve the situation. Um, there's two parts about it. Number one is I, I personally never want to have pain ever doing any of my exercises ever. Okay. Mm. And I'd be very, uh, part of that is because if I'm, let's say I'm doing a, a core exercise, a plank, just as an example, and, I, and that brings on my groin pain. I think that's excellent. Because it tells me your abdominal control is contributing to pissing off your groin. And it also tells me whatever way you're doing that exercises is also pissing off your groin. So I'm after learning two pieces of information. So if I'm doing the exercise properly, number one is it will never annoy the, the irritable area ever. And it's up to me then to, it's always easier to make exercises hard. It's often harder to make exercises easier and regress to the entry point. Mm -hmm. And number two is when I get out of bed tomorrow morning, I should feel the same or better than I felt today. So the more the next morning is always our best friend. That's the best indicator. Mm. And so every two mornings, every morning ideally, but every two mornings, my groin should feel much better from a self-reported point of view, but also in terms of my pain provocation tests. Mm. And if I have pain when I'm doing my exercises or I am not getting better or I'm worse every morning, then mm. my program is not doing the job that's needed. So in fact, when we're looking to resolve the issue, I would never use medication because pain is the single most useful piece of information that you have. Mm. And when you mask that pain with anti-inflammatories or others, you're losing the effective idea about whether you're reloading properly and whether your intervention is affecting change to offload those injured structures. Mm. Right, great. If you, if you have Champions League on, on, on Saturday, you take whatever drugs you need or allow, <laughs> and then you walk around and work from there. And then play. <laughs> yes. And you know, I, I, uh, I sent a post on LinkedIn and Instagram just to tell to uh, my colleagues in, in France, uh, I'm lucky to have an interview with you and just send me your question and I will ask them to end up. So you have three questions. I, I try to, I, I had a lot on um, cognitive load and cognitive tasks. So I, I try to mix them together. So first of them is um, how to assess response to cognitive load, like same testing with and without cognitive load and how do you assess it? Yeah, um, so the, the, there's two parts about that. Uh, number one is it depends on what you mean by cognitive load. Okay. So I can ask you to count backwards and you know, if you're not good at counting, that's going to be a harder cognitive load. than if I ask you to call out colors, then if I ask you to sing, hopefully Oasis will get back together now this week. If I ask you to sing an Oasis song. Um, so when, when it comes to cognitive load, there is a little bit of task specificity. Okay. That that's number one. All right. Whether that's visual reaction, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. One of my colleagues, T. Viharanu, in, in uh, Dublin, in the sports surgery clinic, he found that some people are, you know, quite, some healthy athletes are quite visually dependent um, mm. and are more visually dependent than ACL athletes mm. and found that visual dependence. So when you're, when you're trying to look at healthy athletes and cognitive input, depending on your stimulus, uh, that can be a greater stimulus for some people than for other people. So that's number one. But number two is you're looking for a change in task um, with a change of environment or a change in, in, in stimulus. Uh, the more complicated you make the task, the less reliable and less repeatable it will be. So for example, if you want someone to jump and catch a ball, um, if you're not throwing the ball up at the same height all the time, it's a different task all the time. And therefore, how are you going to reassess it? If you're looking for someone to stand on one leg and count backwards, or do a reaction wall or do a planned and unplanned change direction in response to light or something that's going to be a more reliable way of doing it and mm. um, and generally speaking what you find is with any cognitive load is that response times are a little slower and biomechanical deficits are exaggerated uh, mm. normally beyond what is there already so if someone is good at masking by being you know consciously trying to do the task a uh, cognitive load can reduce or dampen down that conscious effort 
and perhaps expose greater asymmetry between lens. Um, so definitely very worthwhile from an intervention point of view, um, not without its challenges from an objective testing point of view. Thank you. And um, how to add, <laughs> it's kind of the same, but how to add some cognitive impact in how our functional test. For example, if you have a, a triple op, a, 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 an easy one, a, a classic one, a triple op, how can you add some cognitive with uh, light, with, uh, I don't know, three, two, one, go, or if you see the green light, you go, if you see the when one, uh, you go uh, on the left side. I don't know how to you, how can you do this? Yeah, I think there's two parts to that. Number one is, Every test will give you useful information and there's things it won't tell you. So it's really important to know the both. And number two is you want to ask yourself, if I'm doing this test, what outcome am I looking for? So you take a, a, a task like a triple hop, for example. It's a maximal horizontal explosive test. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, you want your athlete, if you're looking to assess that, you want them to give maximal intent to what they're doing. So if you introduce cognitive of load, you're going to have a reduced performance because they're not fully focused on what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, does that add benefit to your interpretation? I don't know. It doesn't if you're looking to assess their explosiveness horizontally. Um, if you find that the asymmetry is greater when you introduce cognitive load or whatever else, okay, that will say that they are using a greater conscious effort on their mm -hmm. operated side and their non-operated mm -hmm. side. But there can be... like. When it nothing will beat going back to play your sport for reintroducing sport specific cognitive load to achieve outcomes. You know, we can do our lights and we can do our thing, but it's all toys, you know, okay? And the, you, you can use toys or not use toys, but it's important to think of it as a progression in a motor skill. So, like doing cognitive tasks standing on one foot is pretty useless, it, it doesn't serve any purpose. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, other than providing another stimulus to a motor task, which is standing on one foot. If you are doing lunges and you're doing them on an uneven surface or with a water bag or counting backwards, or there are various ways of challenging a motor task you're looking to develop. Um, so I think sometimes there's too many toys introduced and we end up having ongoing physical deficits. Um, but secondarily, um, if you're very good at counting backwards or whatever, and th that doesn't tell me anything about how you'll react when the football is in front of you uh, and you're getting a sport specific stimulus. So I think cognitive load is a brilliant motor learning tool. Cognitive assessment, I would suggest you want to be very clear what you're looking to achieve. If you have, uh, you know, uh, let me pick a good example here. Yeah. If you see, you know, I, I have a, a um, reduced balance when I close my eyes or when I count backwards in a single leg mm -hmm. stance. Well, how much of that reduced balance is to do with my hip weakness? And mm -hmm. it's just, I can't cognitively cheat. When, so am I going to get better at the task by doing loads of cognitive stimulus? Or am I going to get better at the task by strengthening my hip so I don't need to make the conscious effort to try and do it properly? And so... I think when we look at these deficits, we need to be very, very clear, especially when it comes to the nervous system and the quadriceps. We need to be very, very clear about the cognitive will exaggerate what's there, but doing it with cognitive input may not resolve the reason that it's there. Um, and it, it, one of the beautiful things about having a biomechanics lab is, you know, your, 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 your work is constantly under review. But like I've had players go back fully complete sport specific training go back into club training and still have persistent knee extension moment deficits in spite of appropriate quadriceps or you know good quadriceps symmetry and that was because there you know there's a couple of reasons for those cases but they had quite a lot of nervous system inhibition at various points and ranges and you got to go and get that back and no amount of sport specific training or cognitive is going to bring it back. You need an intensity. We can, you know, challenge motor skills already with cognitive input. But if you if you have reduced knee extension moment in running, 
no amount of flashlights and uh, stimulus is going to resolve that. If you have a have those qualities and you're looking to challenge it, of course, cognitive is a very, very useful tool with it. So I think in particular in ACL, we do loads of drills. They're really nice. And then they still have a 35% single leg drop jump asymmetry. So I, 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 would, I would be certainly putting all my eggs in the redeveloping the physical qualities bucket because I think that's where we have the most room for growth. But in my motor learning or in my mechanic sessions, I would be introducing lots of different stimulus to try and break those patterns and get those patients to learn. But without the underlying physical qualities, it's very difficult. Well, thank you. Um, on vertical jump, what kind of parameters uh, you look first, and how do you use how do you use them to help your rehab plan and introduction uh, a change of direction? Yeah, so um, we've recently published or circulated the Aspitar ACL protocol, uh, and within that we have all of our transition criteria for return to running, return to Uh, change direction and return to sports specific training and discharge so I'll, I'll use that as a resource also because uh, if I don't read it regularly I forget exactly what the exact numbers are um, but generally speaking when it comes to counter movement jump uh, or a drop jump there's, there's there's three or four variables you can look at there's a performance variable how high you jump uh, how long it took you to execute the task in a counter movement jump or how long you were on the ground in a drop jump Um, and there's lots of useful information there because you can have jump height symmetry in a counter movement jump, but be much slower on the operated leg than the non-operated leg. You can have the same jump height in a drop jump, but spend longer on the ground on the operated side than the non-operated side. So regaining that speed of contraction and quality of contraction mm -hmm. is as important as the, the maximum intent. The second thing is the ground reaction forces. So you'll see a lot around the concentric and epicentric and peak landing uh, impulses, both in terms of asymmetry, in terms of the qualitative shape of the curve to, mm. to, to indicate to you what kind of strategy they're using. Um, and are they pushing off or triple extending fully or are they landing quite rigidly? And you'll tell all of that. Like you, you could almost picture a jump from the force traces if, if, you, if you look at enough of them. Um, and the third one then is the, is the biomechanics. So let's obviously, there's a frontal plane component to, to all of these in terms of knee valgus and, and frontal plane of the foot and hip, but you're looking primarily for knee work and in particular knee extension work. Uh, and what you'll find is that there's reduced knee extension moment, there's reduced sometimes knee flexion angle, that'll lead to reduced work. Uh, and very often that will be compensated for at the hip Um, but in the drop jumps, not at the ankle. So because I haven't got that springiness at the knee, uh, I'm unable to use all of the... So you'll, you'll see this drop off a toe off on the ankle as well. Um, so I think when you're analyzing any test, but it jumps in particular, you want to understand your performance data. You want to understand your ground reaction force data. And you want to understand your biomechanical data. And you, you can test an ACL only looking at jump heights. Mm. You can test an ACL with force plates and learn more. And you can test an ACL with biomechanics and learn even more again. So I'm lucky or unlucky in that I have them all. And therefore, there's, there's valuable information in every piece. I, there are lots that have good jump symmetry and ground reaction force asymmetries or, or inefficiencies. There are lots where the ground reaction force looks good and they're compensating somewhere throughout the kinetic chain. And so, yeah. There's information everywhere, depending on what you have available to you. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And Enda, can you tell us who are your mentors or, or people who inspired you uh, during your career? Yeah, um, that that's a long list. Um, I suppose I had the people that um, I looked up to when I was playing football and was getting my injuries and be treated. Uh, Ian O'Reilly was a local physio uh, and Ronan Carlin uh, in, in, in Cavan and uh, another guy called A.B. McCormick uh, in, in, um, in Dublin when I went to college and so they, they were and actually A.B. went to Australia and that was the primary reason I'd say he alone was the primary reason that I went to Australia um, 
And then I had my colleagues I worked with, as I said, in Blanchestown, but in particular in the sports surgery clinic, both in those early days with, with Andy Franklin Miller and with, um, with Anna Falvey, but my biomechanics colleagues over time, Chris Richter, Kat Daniels, Shane Gore, and then my other clinical colleagues who have gone on to have great careers like uh, Adele Fanning, uh, Neil Welsh, Colin Fuller, Sam Beda, uh, Colin Griffin and others. And so you learn a lot by being in, in the environment of good people and continue obviously now from, from all the crew in Aspatar and, and I'm not going to name all those. There are outside clinicians where I've learned loads, as I said, Peter O'Sullivan and those in, in Curtin University was very informative. Um, my PhD supervisor, Siobhan Strike. Um, but like I would have leaned on the work of, of you know, Franz Bosch a lot when it came to motor learning. Um, there are a whole host of those that have worked in groin pain where you just, you're hoovering up little bits as you come along and seeing what fits with your paradigm of care and what, and what doesn't. Um, so yeah, a, a whole host and, and very fortunate and, and ongoing. We, we, I shamelessly plug like we, we have our, uh, international rehab conference in, in Aspatar uh, again uh, on hamstring and, and rec fem injuries coming in November and it's a pleasure to be involved in the organisation of these because you get to pick the people you want to come to learn loads of so you sit down with a to-do list of All right, where, where, where do I want to, to top up on um, and so you know we, we had a fantastic ACL conference last year we have, we have thigh muscles this year so you, it, it's great to work in and obviously with the foot and ankle conference coming in Strasbourg very soon as well and, and I'm really looking forward to that because there's a, you know, there's a fantastic lineup um, in relation to that so I, I think you, you, you reach a point where you're constantly hoovering up and, and you almost forget you, you fool yourself into thinking well I came up with that no I didn't everything you, you've got you, you've absorbed or learned or, or, or evolved from, from learning from others Thank you. And um, what are your favorite books in sports performance or other? Do you know a, a book you can read again sometimes? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I thought a lot about that and I wasn't sure what, what, what the right answer was. Um, I think if I look at, at books that I reread, they're often to do with probably self-development more than, than, than sports performance. Um, everyone knows the, the, the likes of Bruckner and Kahn and, and um, clinical sports medicine and those ones that you, you dip back into on, on a regular basis. Um, but I definitely, there, there is, a, a, you know, the, the, there's two books in particular. Number one is, is Deep Work um, and another one called uh, So Good They Can't Ignore You. I think they're both by Kahn Newport. But when you're when you're looking going back to what come back to your question on performance when you're looking to reflect on your own performance and where your room for growth is you need time for deep work and uh, whether that's intensive work with, with your patients to have time to, to really think and dive in or writing papers or doing research you know that that's invaluable time and you know we've we've been sharing about about busy clinic days today you don't always get that time and if you don't get the deep work where does the progression come from so that book is really really good uh, and and so good they can't ignore you it, it talks about the craftsman mindset which is a big thing we, we promote in aspatar where we're working on our craft uh, and, and both individually and collectively um if you work on your craft you improve you improve opportunities come before you but most importantly, your job satisfaction is goes through the roof. Um, and I've been very conscious or very deliberate to try and pick opportunities or create opportunities to be uncomfortable and to learn. And the more I've done that, the more opportunities have come my way. But more importantly, the more enjoyment I've got from my work. Great. Thank you. And um, if people want to contact you, how can they? Do you have a... LinkedIn or social media where you active? Yeah, um, it varies all the time in that I'm 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 I make a burst every now and again and then I I, I hide for a little while. So uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I think it's Enda underscore King, uh, and same for I think it's Enda dot King for Instagram, uh, and on uh, LinkedIn as well. So I, it's interesting. LinkedIn is not something I would have leaned on hugely, but over the last couple of years, it certainly has come to the fore a lot more, both for 
professional networking, but also for disseminating research and, and, and seeing what, what's going on with other, with other groups. So I think as um, uh, Twitter seems to be hanging on by the, by the skin of its teeth at the minute, but uh, you get a lot of good inspiration from Instagram and a, a lot of good connections from LinkedIn. So any of the above is good. And I have a, um, a website where I, I barely maintain um, where I'm, I'm presenting in an upcoming basis and uh, any of the research I'm involved in as well. So that's enda underscore king.com as well. Yeah, perfect. And, and the last question uh, to finish. How do you build your own high level? You know, we talk a lot about uh, studies, about uh, making some sports. And, and what, is your, uh, what is your secret, kind of secret? Uh, high level professionally or high level what, what do you mean exactly as so you want it, it's like the question what's your what's your definition of performance what is your high level and how do you build it yeah i think um i think you have to prioritize hmm. and unfortunately you can you can look on instagram you, you can't prioritize everything hmm. you can't prioritize Uh, work and development and family and social and golf and <laughs> all of the above and uh, if you don't and I don't necessarily have the balance right and um, but if you don't balance all those things certain things will fall away uh, your family will fall away or your health will fall away or your profession will not progress and um, I'm very lucky I have an incredibly supportive family of incredibly supportive wife and three beautiful kids um but i don't see them as much as i would like or as much as they would like because of the professional side of things um we're very busy at work so you have to be very conscious to maintain exercise maintain health but that means you know reduce perhaps social time uh, yeah. and, and reduce interact so i think I, i i don't know necessarily if i'm at a high level but i do know that um You have, you have to be you have to be very deliberate and you have to decide what's what's important to you or what your priorities are um and then you have to program accordingly and if you are not getting where you want to go whether that's health or relationships or family or whatever else i guarantee you if you look back at what you're doing your 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 actions are not matching your priorities and um, you might say they are but but they're not Um, and that's that's an ongoing challenge and I think that that's part of life and I don't know what the right or wrong is and you can have balance you know mm. but when you're in something you need to be in it and then when you're out of it you need to be out of it uh, and that that can be a, a difficult thing for, for everyone but um, I think I think where you want to see growth especially professionally create yourself a timeline create yourself a problem and deliver it because unless there's a bit of pressure not, nothing gets done mm. Thank you very much, and uh, it's uh, very interesting. And, and thank you every again for your time. I, I know you were busy, and you're still, <laughs> but it was a precious time for me and for lots of, uh, I, I hope, uh, French people and other. And looking forward to seeing you in uh, Strasbourg in a few weeks. And yeah, thanks again. My my, my pleasure, Julian, and very excited to catch up with you soon. Yeah. Bye. Cheers.